You're watching Economics Amplified, the latest thinking on the biggest issues from UChicago's Becker Friedman Institute. Um, my name is Lars Hansen. I'm here in the capacity as the uh, director of the Becker Friedman Institute. And I'd like to extend a warm welcome to today about uh, today's panel on understanding inequality and what to do about it. Um, this is an example of the uh, uh, of our aims to make the Becker Friedman Institute the uh, one of the top intellectual destinations for the best economic research and the best and, and the best discussions of the uh, important economic questions of the day. Um, so I, I, I'm looking forward to this this panel of uh, distinguished uh, participants, and I'm and I hope we can all you know benefit from their insights. We're we're certainly fortunate enough today to have uh, Thomas Piketty, Stephen Durloff, Kevin Murphy, and our moderator Jim Hackman. Um, I'd like to, in addition to the Becker Friedman Institute, I'd certainly like to thank the uh, uh, the, uh, the Harris Public Policy School and uh, um, uh, for co-hosting this, uh, and their dean Dan Deermeyer, uh, and also I'd like to acknowledge the uh, contributions from the Human Capital and Economic Opportunity Network for their support for this event. And I'd like to thank you know a lot. You know these events require incredible staff efforts, and we've had important staff efforts from the BFI, the HCEO, and Harris to make this happen. Um, so I'm, I could, t uh, you're not here to hear me, but let me just briefly say a little bit about the uh, three different panelists. They're all very, very well known, so I'm not going to give elaborate in introductions to them. Thomas Piketty is a professor at the Paris School of Economics, uh, uh, currently visiting the Harris School, and, uh, and, and as you know, has done very important work on the role of political and fiscal institutions and in their historical evolution of income and wealth, uh, wealth inequality. Stephen Durloff is the uh, Kenneth Arrow Professor of Economics at the University of uh, Wisconsin-Madison. I slipped there because Steve visits the University of Chicago quite often. <laughs> so, he's, so he's like one of us anyway. Uh, uh, and, and, and he's done important work on, on, on kind of social networks and, and, and uh, economic development and growth, which, uh, among a variety of other areas. Kevin Murphy, who is the uh, George Stigler Distinguished Service Professor uh, of Economics um, here, at the, uh, here at the University of Chicago and co-chair of the Becker Friedman Institute. He's known for his very important work of kind of uh, microeconomics across the board, imp important contribution to uh, kind of labor economics, in um, inequality, unemployment, wage behavior, and the like. And then finally, the moderator who's going to, I guess, keep everyone on track and organized and, uh, um, and coherent is Jim Heckman. Uh, <laughs> they, will, they will follow his lead on this, I'm sure. And he is the um, Henry Schultz Distinguished Service Professor of Economics and a Nobel Laureate uh, in, in, in 2000. Um, Jim, as you know, has made important contributions to uh, empirical microeconomics, econometrics, and a variety of, field, in a variety of other fields. So I'm going to turn the podium over to Jim, and he will uh, take it from here. Thank you very much. Okay, well, as Lars said, I am the moderator, and I want to be very moderate in my own comments. I do want to thank uh, all of the sponsoring organizations, and I want to point out that one of the sponsors of this organization, uh, the Harris School Public Policy, is also having a, another event later this afternoon with Thomas. Uh, I believe it starts around 7 o'clock, 6.30, uh, and will uh, uh, be followed. A uh, lecture will be followed by a reception. So I would advertise that event as well. So I just make uh, the the obvious comment that there are few issues that are more gripping than the question of inequality in society, not only in U.S. society but society around the world. Its various dimensions, uh, which aspects are really problematic, which ones may not be so problematic, and what public policy should be. And so we're going to have a discussion on this. And um, the format of the discussion is really going to be the following. Each of the speakers, and it's a debate. It's a, a, not a debate, but a discussion. It's going to be a debate of the issues. <laughs> Sorry. I'm making all kinds of slips. I guess I stayed up too late last night. It's not a debate. It may turn into a debate, but I'll try to prevent that. But a discussion. Uh, but the format, then, is really the following, that there will be uh, presentations by each of our three featured speakers, 10 minutes each, roughly, where they can state a position, where they talk about inequality, what should be done about it, what's problematic, what effective policies might be. Then in the second part, which is be roughly 30 minutes, but it could be longer, so it's, that's my discretion, our discretion, we will also have a uh, discussion among the three participants, just uh, 
following up on each other's initial thoughts so that we can actually discuss these issues in, in, in some depth. And, um, and then uh, there will be some time, possibly, for questions and answers from the floor, but we want to collect them. We're gonna have some people, I don't know, I can't really see with these bright lights, but there are some people out there who will take written questions and we will try to distill those questions. But in order to get the flow going, I'd like to be able to have uh, uh, these questions collected during the first uh, hour or so, the first 45, 50 minutes of this discussion, and then uh, try to present some of the most interesting and uh, uh, broad uh, spanning questions. So without any further introduction, Toma Fikidi, welcome to the University of Chicago. We're delighted to have you and we look forward to your uh, stay on campus. Thank you very much. Thank you. So you want me to go? Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Jim. Thank you, everybody, for organizing uh, this event. So let me first apologize uh, that, you know, for the fact that my uh, English uh, sounds a lot like French, and I hope... Uh, <laughs> Let, let me also apologize for writing uh, such a long book. You know, I know it's... Uh... <laughs> On the other hand, you know, I, I think there are reasons why it's long. The, the reason is that what I'm trying to do in this book is to put together a lot of uh, historical material on inequality. And I guess this is really the, uh, uh, you know, the, the core of what I've been doing in the past 15 years is to pursue, you know, together with Atkinson, Saez, and, uh, and, and several dozen economists all across the world, we have been pursuing a research agenda on inequality, which started uh, a, a bit more than half a century ago with the work of Kuznets. So as you probably know, Kuznets was the first economist not only to uh, compute the first national accounts for the US, first GDP series for the interwar period in the US, but also to use for the first time the federal income tax data. So the federal income tax had been created in 1913, and he used this data between 1913 and 1948 to compute the share of national income going to the different income groups, the top 10%, the bottom 90%. So he, he, Kuznets had only one country, the US, over a 35-year period, but this was a lot more than before. Okay, so people had been talking about inequality forever, uh, uh, Marx, uh, Ricardo, but, but with no data, which puts a strong uh, limitation on what you can say, or actually it puts no limit on what you can say, which is, <laughs> which is a bit... So at least Kuznets had, had, had data which were not perfect, but, and, but you know, which were much more than before. And he came with a very optimistic conclusion, which was a decline of inequality in the US between 1913 and 1948, the orders of magnitude are that the, the share of national income going to the top 10% dropped from about one half to one third of national income, about 45, 50% at the beginning of the period to 30, 35% uh, in the 1950s. And then it stabilized there for a couple of decades. And all what we've been doing with uh, Saez, Atkinson, and many other co-authors is in a way to extend this work to many more years and many more countries. And this was not done before, I think, largely because this kind of historical uh, fiscal data used, uh, you know, look too, too historical for economists and too economic for historians, so nobody was really uh, collecting it in a systematic manner. So this is what we've done, and this is the story I try to describe in my book, uh, using this material together with material on uh, the evolution of wealth rather than uh, simply income. And then, you know, I try to propose interpretation. I try to draw lessons for the future, which I'm going to say a few words about now. But let me make very clear that, you know, I am much better at analyzing the past than the future. And, you know, I don't require anybody to agree with all of my conclusion. You know, at the end of the day, we know too little. You know, we know a little bit more than what we used to, I think. Um, but uh, we still know too little. So there are very different ways uh, to interpret the same data. This, uh, we are in the social sciences. We are not going to have a, a, a perfect uh, control experiment to redo the history of income distribution over the recent decades and see what would have happened. So we have to be modest. And, and still, I think there are important lessons to be drawn uh, about the, the sources of inequality and the, the way to, uh, to reduce inequality uh, in, in some cases when this is necessary. So le let me draw very quickly some of the uh, conclusion findings that I, that I have learned from this research. In particular, if we try to understand uh, rising inequality in the United States in recent decades, say, 
So starting around 1980, you have a, a return to a level of income inequality which roughly corresponds to the level that Kuznet measured at the beginning of his period. So between 1950-1980, we have a stabilization of the share uh, going to the top 10% group to about 30-35% of total income. And in recent decades, we are back to 45, 50, or maybe a little bit more than 50% at the end of the period. Why is it so? I, I think it's, it's interesting. Very often we talk about you know, globalization, uh, China entering the world labor market, uh, and putting pressure on the low skill and medium skill group in, in, in developed countries as, as the explanation. I think you know this is certainly part of the explanation, but the only problem is that globalization uh, happened not only in the U.S. but also in Sweden, in, in Japan, in Germany, in, in Europe, you know, everywhere. And you don't have the same rise in inequality everywhere. So you need a bit more than just globalization if you want to explain what we see. And clearly, different policies, different institutions in the in the broad range of domain, from education to labor market institution to progressive taxation, corporate governance. I think I've played a role. So there's no magic bullet or magic explanation, but there's a set of factors that have played a role. Unequal access to education, I think, is clearly a part, a possibly a very big part of the explanation for why inequality has increased so much more in the US uh, than in the rest of the rich world in, as compared to uh, Sweden, Germany, Japan, uh, uh, Europe. Uh, in the US, we have, as we all know, you know, very good top universities at the top, but you know, the bottom half of the population, uh, not only they don't go to, to Chicago or Harvard, but uh, there's a kind of uh, high school and, and, and community college they go to. I think there's a gap between the quality of education available for the bottom groups and the top groups, which is arguably higher than in Europe or in Japan. And, and this, I think, explains partly why rising inequality has been uh, so large in the US. And this is possibly the main, the main explanation. Now, this cannot be the only explanation. Well, first, because there are evolutions both at the bottom and the top of the distribution, which are difficult to explain just with education. At the bottom, I think the, the, you know, the decline of unions and also the decline in the minimum wage, uh, an area where uh, the US used to be uh, uh, in advance, in a way, with respect to other countries uh, uh, back in the 50s, 60s, and, and the minimum wage has been dragging down. Uh, in the recent decades, you know, probably this has, this has played an important role in the, in the evolution of the, of the bottom part of the distribution. Now, at the top of the distribution, the rise in very top managerial compensation that you see in the US much more than in Europe or Japan is difficult to explain simply uh, in terms of education or productivity. Uh, or, you know, at least I couldn't find... Uh, uh, evidence uh, for, uh, you know, when you, when you pay top managers uh, $10 million rather than $1 million in certain sectors rather than others, in certain countries rather than others, do you get the extra productivity or performance that you would, uh, that you would expect on this basis? You know, I, I, at least, you know, I could not find it in the kind of data uh, uh, I have been using, uh, particularly with Emmanuel Says and Stephanie Stancheva. And, and our conclusion is that at the top part of the distribution, you know, it's not just unequal access to education, it's also the pay setting process and the, the, to some extent the corporate governance system uh, that has become um, uh, uh, more favorable to, to top managers for, for various uh, reasons, possibly also the incentives for very top managers to put the right people in the right compensation committee have been uh, increased by the huge decline in tax progressivity uh, at the top that has occurred in this country rather than uh, uh, more, much more than in the, in the rest of the developed world. So let me just uh, conclude more generally by, by pointing out that it's a, there's really a whole set of institutions that matter, you know, from education, labor market institution, progressive taxation. Inequality is a complicated uh, story. You know, if, if the story was simple, uh, uh, if the, at least if the story I am telling was simple, you know, the, my book will be 10 pages long uh, rather than uh, 600 or 700. You know, it depends on the language of translation. But uh, so, so the entire story is complicated, involves contradictory mechanisms. There are powerful forces that can lead to a reduction uh, of inequality, uh, but there are also forces that can, that can lead to a rising inequality for reasons which are uh, difficult to, uh, to justify. So in particular, the, the level of inequality uh, uh, in access to education, let me uh, maybe uh, 
conclude with this. Uh, I, 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 there's the data that I didn't use in my book because it was not available then, but which I found very striking, which was put together by uh, uh, my colleague and friend, friend uh, Emmanuel Saez, together with Rash Shetty and other, um, and other uh, uh, colleagues, where they are able to match the uh, administrative tax data of income tax return of the parents with the social security number of the children, of the students, and you have this graph where you put on the horizontal axis the parental income and on the vertical axis the probability to be in college at age 20. And not only you get a straight line, but it's almost the first diagonal. You know, it, it goes almost from 0% chance to go to college to 100%. Well, not quite. It goes from 20% to 90%. Okay, so if your parents are in the bottom 10% of the distribution, you have a 20% probability to be in college at age 20 right now in this country. And if your parents are in the bottom, the top 10, you have a 90% probability. So it's not 100, but you know, it's 90% as opposed to 20% at the bottom. And of course, you don't go to the same university that the people at the bottom when they go to university. So I think you know, the, the gap between the official discourse in terms of meritocracy, equal opportunity, and what's really going on is just you know, incredibly large. And I think you know, the, the imagination of the elite to justify inequality and to have discourse about equal opportunity, you know, I think this imagination is uh, with no limit. You know, uh, every country, I should say, it's not only in the US, you know, in my country, in France, you know, people also have representation of meritocracy, which are, you know, very strong discourse, but the reality is that, you know, sometimes we put uh, three times more uh, public resources in the most uh, elitist uh, schools uh, as compared to what we put in the uh, uh, basic university uh, uh, curriculum where the more disadvantaged groups go to. So, you know, the, the, the hypocrisy is present in, in, in every country. You know, in every country there is a, a tendency of the elite and the winner of the system to justify inequality with very strong claims uh, about, uh, about meritocracy, about the fact that inequality is in the benefit of the poorest group. And you know, sometimes these claims are true, but sometimes these claims are completely um, uh, off the mark. And I think it's possible, it's very important to put these kind of claims under public scrutiny, to have access to the data. So for instance, the, you know, data on university admission. You know, in my book, I report uh, estimates showing that the average income of the parents of Harvard University students right now corresponds to the average income of the top 2% of the distribution of US family income. You know, which doesn't mean that nobody from below the top two is going, but it means something very precise that the number of people from below the top two who are going to Harvard is so small, and the people who come from the top two are so high in the top two that the overall average is as if all students had been picked at random within the top two. So I think, you know, it's, it, and it's actually very difficult to access this kind of data. And, and in fact, in this example, it was very complicated just to publish it. So, you know, we talk about transparency, we talk, but, you know, I think there's a, there's a lot of progress to be made in this area, uh, you know, in order to, uh, to have a more informed uh, democratic uh, uh, discussion about inequality. So let me stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was very good, Thomas. Thank you very much. Our next speaker will be uh, Stephen Durloff, who was introduced as a uh, faculty member at the University of Wisconsin, who frequently visits the University of Chicago and is a co-organizer of the Human Capital and Economic Opportunity uh, Network. Steve? So I have to apologize for one form of inequality, which is I've lost my voice. And so I'll, be <laughs> I'll, I'll try to speak as loudly as I can. It's obviously an honor to be here. I think in terms of my initial comments, what I'd like to do is to take a somewhat different perspective from Thomas in the sense that uh, rather than focus on very broad theories of, of inequality, of income distribution, of dynamics, I want to focus specifically on the disadvantaged within the United States. By way of background, my view is that inequality, frankly, is too big a phenomena for any, uh, any small, low-dimensional theory to, to speak much about it. In other words, when we talk about the 1%, that's really a very different thing than talking about the, uh, the state of inner cities in the, in the United States. And so what I'd like to focus on is specifically the relatively disadvantaged people in, uh, in America. Now, in doing that, uh, I would want to start off by uh, sort of 
telling you about three pictures that you may have seen, three figures which are very popular in uh, not only academia but in uh, public policy discussions now. And then I want to link them together with some observations on my own perspectives on, uh, on, on certain phenomena I think are important in understanding disadvantage uh, in the 21st century. Uh, the first one, uh, figure I'm thinking of, uh, some people call it the Heckman curve. And it's the observation that if one looks at the rates of return to investment uh, in, in children and adolescents, there's a uh, significant decline between investments at the age of three and the age of 17. And so the, uh, the Heckman Research Program on Early Childhood Investment has identified these very large differences in rates of return, which are suggestive about something in terms of what needs to be done if you want to raise the uh, relatively disadvantaged in terms of uh, the, the entire uh, developmental life course approach. Now, the curve itself is a nice observation. It's a useful summary. But what I think is important are the mechanisms that underlie it. And there's really two things I want to emphasize. First, the work in early childhood development has been instrumental in creating a, uh, a synthesis, a synergy between psychology and economics that I think is uh, extremely fruitful. Now, I'm distinguishing that from behavioral economics. When I say psychological economics, what's important is the recognition and the development of a vision that social and emotional skills are part and parcel of what creates economic success as well as a flourishing life. The second part of the uh, work in early childhood development that I want to emphasize is that it moves beyond income. In other words, in thinking about the consequences of rich early childhood investment or stable families and the like, it's not just a matter of asking questions about wages or even employment. It's asking about interactions with the criminal justice system, with the stability of families and, uh, and personal relationships as an adult. And so I put those on the table because I think that 21st century inequality demands that we move beyond the conventional measures of income to thinking about uh, perhaps sends notions of capabilities, but the word I prefer to use is simply is what it means to have a flourishing life. In other words, there's many dimensions that define what we think of as, the, uh, as, as desirable outcomes for individuals. So I put all of that on the table as one, one facet of thinking about disadvantage. In other words, recognizing that disadvantage damages people in ways that influ have to do with their psychological makeup, and that has to be part of the story of how to reduce it. The second figure, which is quite popular, is due to uh, Raj Chetty, uh, Emmanuel Sayas, Nathan Hendren, and Patrick Klein, and it's the so-called geography of economic opportunity. And what that is, is, is a, it's a picture of the United States, which shows very differing degrees of intergenerational mobility if one looks at relatively uh, small geographic units. Now, the picture itself is uh, you know, of enormous interest and a very important piece of information. What underlies that is a longer tradition of research looking at the influence of social factors on individual outcomes. And so here I'm thinking giving pride of place to the idea that residential neighborhoods and schools are social units which are influencing individuals. And so what one has in conjunction, in parallel almost, to the psychological literature that's developed is a literature that is breaking down the barriers between sociology and economics. And I don't mean that, and I mean that in the good faith sense. I'm taking ideas in sociology, be they having to do with how identities are socially determined, how individuals are influenced by peers, role models, and the like, how aspirations are formed. All of these are being brought to bear in trying to understand how it is that exposure to poverty, exposure to disadvantage, has long-term consequences. And so, in my judgment, a fundamental issue, dimension in addition to the development of a, of a psychological economics is a sociological economics. In other words, a recognition that uh, human beings are uh, you know, very much influenced by this sequence of, uh, of interactions they have at a social level. The third figure, which has gotten quite a bit of publicity, is uh, something called the Great Gatsby Curve. And it, this is a cross-sectional one, so I'm going to deviate from my only looking at the US claim. And it's the observation that if one uh, simply constructs a graph for some advanced industrialized economies, it appears that those economies that have relatively low uh, levels of uh, cross-sectional inequality also have high social mobility. And so this was identified by Miles Korak originally in work. And there's correct questions about the measurement. Like, I'm not going to sit here and state that this is some you know, definitive fact. But nevertheless, there's a very important suggestion there. And that is there may be something about the economic and social forces that exist at a point in time that when more inequality exists, somehow are translating into reduced mobility. 
that in some sense is the uh, strongest attack one might make on the conventional notion of meritocracy, at least in the American case. Now, how do I think about these things together? Well, uh, and again, I'm just going to give you my own perspective. It's self-serving in the sense it's the research that I've been doing for the last 20 years. The way that I think about these questions together is that uh, one should uh, should think about, and this is uh, roughly speaking, a uh, what I've called a membership's theory of inequality. And what I mean by that is that individuals throughout their life courses are members of different social groups. The most important ones, obviously, the family. There are these objects that form called parents, where a sort of mating is going to tell you a lot about the dynamics of intergenerational mobility, but whatever the cross-sectional inequality is across parents, that is going to be translated into inequality across offspring. But that's, even though that may be the most important membership, and that's the sense in which I link it to the psychological economics, there's other sets of memberships that are clearly salient as well. One example would be residential neighborhoods. Another example would be schools. Another example would be higher education. Yet another example would be firms. And here there are interesting questions in my mind as to how technology has altered the extent to which workers of different skill levels interact in the same production function. It's a very different world in which it's driven by Microsoft versus the Ford Motor Company in terms of interactions of different skill types. So what I want to put on the table is a general vision that if we want to understand inequality, one of the many perspectives, and this is obviously not a substitute for thinking about the factor returns and, and, the, uh, and the like, but one perspective is to recognize that individuals are influenced throughout their life course by the groups that they are members of and they interact with. Now, what turns out to be important in those types of theories, or uh, that theory is, is a couple of things. The first is that it represents a vision that says that the key mechanism in understanding persistent inequality is actually segregation. In other words, a sort of mating of uh, highly educated parents. Economic segregation, racial segregation of school districts. Increasing segregation by quality level, uh, or and by uh, high school achievement across colleges all of these become mechanisms that translate initial inequalities into persistent inequalities both within the life course and across generations. And so, again, from my perspective, in thinking about you know, how can, you know, what sort of policies are necessary to, to break disadvantage circa 2015, I put particular emphasis on policies that achieve various forms of partial integration. Now, obviously, I'm not a madman who wants to interfere with the marriage process. On the other hand, policies, be they the location of public, he may think I am, but I'm not. <laughs> policies, be they affirmative action, be they the location of public housing, be they the voucher systems, be they the drawing of school district zoning, all of them speak to the potential for altering who interacts with who, and in my judgment, that is where the, uh, uh, the currency of egalitarian justice is still uh, Cohen's term uh, lies today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve, for that position. Uh, that, uh, Kevin Murphy is uh, a, the George Stigler Distinguished Service Professor. And Kevin uh, has done a great deal of work uh, some 20, 25 years ago on skill bias, technical change, its importance, empirical importance, and its consequences uh, in the labor market and for the larger society. So Kevin, please. I'm going to deviate a little bit from what's happened so far, and I'm actually going to try to say that I think we can do a lot with a little bit of economics as opposed to needing a lot of different things. That doesn't mean we're going to go all the way. That doesn't mean the things that Steve talked about aren't important. I think they are critical, actually. I think they're part of a more general focus on human capital and, and the strong complementarities that really exist in the human capital sphere both within an individual over his, his lifetime, which talks about why interventions so early are, are uh, so important, also across people, within the family, within the neighborhood, and the like. That's going to tie back to what Tomas said about uh, opportunities for different groups and the opportunities. But I think it's important to focus back on some very basic economics. Uh, we started today, Tomas start, talked about income shares. Um, the trouble with looking at income is it fails to make uh, the most fundamental distinction that economists make. I always end up teaching a business school, love to talk about what separates economists from accountants. Uh, 
And, and the biggest difference is economists divide expenditure into price and quantity. And you might have a 10% increase in the return to capital in terms of its income, and, but it's a very different story if it's 10% more capital earning the same return or the same amount of capital earning 10% higher return. So very different things, have very different implications for what happens in the rest of the economy, very different implications for workers. Um, so I'm going to talk about prices and quantities, and I'm going to focus mostly on, on within, within labor, because at least within the United States, I think far and away, the most important changes we've seen over time are changes in the relative returns of different types of labor, low-skilled and high-skilled labor. If you look at the returns to higher education, just measured as the income differential, and let's say it's all the causal effect of education, but between those groups of workers who end up with graduating college and those who, say, stop at high school, comparing today to 1980, returns of somewhere between doubled and tripled, depending on how you measure them. That's an enormous increase in the income gap. If we compare the workers in the top 10 percent to the bottom 10 percent, similar story. Enormous expansion in uh, those differentials. So one of the things we want to do is we want to understand where that came from. I, 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 I applaud Tama in his, in his book for talking about long-term changes. I think long-term forces are really the story. I think the same things that have been driving the economy for decades are a lot of the same things that are going on today. So if you think about it, uh, the links between inequality and, and another very important phenomenon, which I'll call economic growth, I think are, are key to understanding both. So I'm going to step back a second and say, well, what accounts for growth? Where does, where does economic growth come from? Well, economists have worked on this for a long time. And basically, we can think about economic growth coming from three primary places. One, we get better technology over time. We learn how to do things that we couldn't do before. In agriculture, that might be hybrid corn. It might be the advent of the semiconductor. might be earlier inventions of electric, electric power, discovery that you could use fossil fuels. Numerous things that happened over time. New technologies came into play. In response to those new technologies, we invested in physical capital. That is, the machines and other things that utilized and implemented those technologies. We also invested heavily in human capital increasing both the education as well as other skills of our workforce. If you follow the course of the 20th century and into the 21st century, the rates of increase in technology, physical capital, human capital are really astounding. If you focus on a worldwide basis, even more so. So that's a story in terms of growth. So the, all those forces work together. That is, we get more growth, we get more technology, we need the capital to implement that, we need the human capital to both produce the technology and implement that technology. Think about a modern automobile plant where we now have robots replacing workers putting manual parts together. We, we needed the technology to develop the robots. We needed to invest the physical capital to improve the plant. And we need the human capital to design, build, and, and maintain those robots. Far fewer, less skilled workers. This brings up another part of the important equation which is technology and physical capital both tend to be complementary, at least in recent century, with, uh, human cap with, with skill. So while technology, physical capital, and human capital growth together work to increase the output over time, they work in opposite directions on inequality. High, better technology and more physical capital tends to raise the demand for skilled workers relative to unskilled workers, creating opportunities for new skilled worker activities while replacing the activities traditionally performed by less skilled workers. It's the growth in human capital that counteracts that. So what happens to inequality in many dimensions, particularly across education, is sort of a tug of war with growing technology and physical capital on the one hand, and so that's the demand side of the model, and growth in human capital on the supply side. When demand grows faster than supply, prices, here the return to human capital rises, when supply grows faster than demand, prices fall. In that case, the return to human capital falls. That theory does an amazing job, I think, of explaining much of what we've seen. Not all of it, but significant components of what we've seen over decades. Since about 1980 in the United States, we've seen the supply side fall short. The supply of human capital hasn't grown as fast as demand over, here, over that period. And not surprisingly, 
from a point of view of economics, inequality has risen, and risen dramatically. It's interesting to talk about the rise at the very top of the income distribution, because if you use the rise in inequality for college relative to high school, and say that exact same extrapolation would have happened to people way up in the distribution, and you do it the way economics tells us in terms of the expansion in the premium, it actually fits the data extremely well. So it's really, there's not a mystery really there. But it's not all about the top end, and Steve's right to emphasize that. The growth in human cap, the growth in inequality is a pervasive phenomenon in the United States. It has happened in the bottom of the distribution, happened at the top of the distribution, although the timing is somewhat different. More of the growth at the bottom was in earlier decades. But if you look over the period as a whole, it's a very pervasive phenomenon. And very pervasive phenomena, in my mind, require very pervasive answers as to why they happened. Could be a coincidence that 97 different things happened at different parts, but I think it's much more coherent to think about something going on. And I think these fundamental forces of technology and supply are a big part of the story. Let me talk a little bit about what happens when supply falls short. And this is a paper Bob Topel and I did. What's happened over time is when, if you don't produce enough skilled workers, the wages of skilled workers go up relative to unskilled workers. Well, the forces of economics don't stop operating. Those skilled workers have an incentive to then supply more skill to the marketplace. They invest more in themselves. They work harder. Those supply responses exacerbate measured inequality because it actually weighs the wages and incomes even further for those high-skilled workers. You get the opposite dynamic going on at the bottom of the distribution. Wages fall. They're working less. Work, they, put, they, they invest less in their own human capital, and that creates a widening of inequality. So if, you, if, you, if, if the supply side doesn't keep up, the net is, of course, an even worse exacerbation of inequality. I think that goes a pretty good way to, 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 to answering the questions of what we've seen. The other, the other part that I think is important, and, and Steve got at this some in his discussion, is that we don't want to focus entirely on income. Human capital, I think, is again a big part of the story. And the big difference between human capital and physical capital is that you take it home with you at night. When you go home at night, the human capital you have goes back to the house with you. And it affects many things. Your skill at raising your children, your skill at taking care of your own health, your skill at running your financial life, how good you are in dealing with friends, family, and the like. So in human capital shortfall is really, I think, quite critical. One answer you might have is, why do we have such a human capital shortfall? Here, I think I would again would agree. I think one of the problems we have is we have a lot of people who don't have very good opportunities to develop human capital, tying back to the idea that really what matters is if you, can't, if you fall behind early, it's not impossible to catch up, but it's extremely difficult. And so if I grow up in a community and have poor choice of schools, that's going to limit the supply response. So one answer is it's critical that we enable more people to get the human capital they need. And it's not just education. It, it's get the other skills they need, the, quote, soft skills, that while people might call them soft, they're hard in terms of the fact that they're not so easy to get, and they're hard in the sense that they really matter for production. So call them soft skills if you like, but they're really hard skills from the point of view of what matters. They don't, don't, they don't want to diminish their importance from that point of view. But we need to get that more investment in human capital. And you might say, well, I can't rescue everybody. Not everybody's going to be able to get more human capital. The saving grace of the economics is you don't have to. Is if we were to increase the human capital of some segment of the population that's currently not keeping up, they would benefit because they would have more human capital and reap the high road to return that we see in the marketplace today. But the remaining, the remaining low-skilled workers would benefit. They would benefit because there would be less competing supply of low-skilled workers. And that would then benefit them in terms of higher compensation, incentivizing them to be more attached to the labor force, labor force to work more, to do the other things that I think improve all the rest of the aspects of your life. So the answer, I think, is, I think, has to focus a lot on human capital. Let me say a little bit about physical capital, because physical capital plays a role here. And there's been work recently, and in, in, in important work by, by people here right at Chicago, working on changes in capital share. 
And it is true that there has been a fall in capital, I mean, in labor share of income, rising capital share. And let me give you a simple way you might think about it. I'm not sure it's the right answer, but it, it fits pretty, it, it fits reasonably well. Let's think about what happened is technology change is a little different than it used to be in the past. The new technologies are even better at doing what workers used to do than the old technologies were. And that creates a greater bias toward physical capital. Well, the answer is, is that bad for workers? The answer is, in the short run, technical bias against workers will tend to be not as good for workers as it was biased toward them, because it'll shift factor prices in favor of physical capital. However, in the long run, if we allow a supply response by capital, actually that would be undone. And in fact, the direction of bias really won't matter very much. The growth in gain will all go to labor if, in fact, we have a, a very elastic supply of this physical capital. So I think it's, you know, so think about it. If, if what you do, because there's technical bias, capital share maybe goes up, and you say, okay, good, I'm going to tax capital, keep capital from growing. Well, if you do that, you're going to lock in place the, the bad aspect from the point of view of labor. If you allow capital to respond the way it would, and capital to grow now even faster than it would have because its return is higher than it would have been historically, actually more of that would get competed back to workers. And that's been the process of growth over a long, long period of time. It's not surprising from an economic standpoint that, that you know, the return on capital hasn't changed very much over the last 100-something years while the return to labor has risen so dramatically. They're telling me I'm out of time, so I'm going to stop. But I will tell you, if there's, a, if there's a shortage of anything right now, it's skilled labor, and we should do what we can to, to increase it and create more opportunity for people at the bottom. Thank you. Okay. OK, very good. We have now moved to the second part of this, and my job is to be a moderator. And I'll try. I'll try to be fair. Because there are a number of issues that have been raised, in fact, so many that I think we could probably keep this discussion going for the next week, but we won't. Uh, <laughs> but I, I will try to, I think we should start off. I think we should start off with, uh, with maybe uh, a discussion. Each of you stated some position. You have a relatively different emphasis on, on different factors. But you know, economists are famous for quantifying and trying to get an idea of the relative importance of these different factors. And I was curious if each of you could make some statement. You, you emphasize different aspects of uh, what the source of inequality. And I would be very curious about just what the nature of the, uh, the evidence is about the quantitative importance of this. I, I, I would just throw out this OECD calculation about three or four years ago. You've probably seen this, where they were, they were looking at sort of what the increase in inequality was. And this was income inequality, so it didn't get at the theme that, uh, that uh, Steve was talking about uh, fully. But they said, well, you know, for example, something like a sort of mating, the idea of people mating, well, maybe accounted for like 10, 11, 12 percent of the increase in inequality. Uh, they looked at the labor market, and it was really the labor market only for men. That explained roughly about 30, 35 percent of income inequality as measured by OECD, which doesn't take into account the top incomes. And then there was a huge residual. <laughs> so it wasn't really very satisfactory at what there was. So I'd be curious what each of you might say about the quantification of this. Uh, and then also, if you could, to comment on a point that Thomas threw out at the very beginning of his talk. And that is, Kevin, your talk was primarily about the US economy and the developments here. And if I understand Thomas correctly, I think he was also saying that there was a very uneven pace across countries, even in Western Europe. And if we broaden the scope to include, for example, less developed countries and the like, then the whole discussion of inequality would, would be changed. So I would ask each of you, maybe you could A, quantify the sense of how important these things are, just roughly. I realize that this isn't uh, really firm. But, and, and then to sort of comment on why the uneven, what seems like an uneven pace of uh, technical change uh, or uneven change of, of inequality uh, across different uh, political, social, cultural environments. So uh, who wants to go first? Uh, okay, I'm Ken. happy. Uh, <laughs> first, first, I'm surprised. first, I'd like to say if we're going to go to the international front, I think we don't want to just focus within countries. One of the things we, none of us have really talked about here is 
across countries. And there's important stories there in terms of you think of worldwide inequality of growth in incomes like in places like China and in India, you know, with, across the country of inequality differences. So I think we don't want to lose sight and solely focus on inequality within countries because right. that I think would miss a lot of the worldwide story. In terms of thinking about the U.S., Again, I, I would go back to make the price versus quantity distinction. If, 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 if a group is earning more because they have more capital, they have more assets, they have more human capital, that's one thing. I, I think for me, I like to think about what are the root drivers. And in, in, in a market economy, prices are really the root drivers, whether the prices of labor or prices of capital and, and those things. And for, I think, the mass majority of workers in the United States, I would say the growth within workers is really the big story. That is, the last 40 years or 35 years from 1980 to today or 1975 to today looks incredibly different. If I'm talking about a college-educated, you know, affluent family, then it would look for a high school dropout family. And it looks very different in terms of, you know, income, in terms of work. You know, if you look at work effort across, Bob Topel and I did this thing. If you look at work effort by, you know, where you are on the wage distribution, you go back to the late 60s, it was pretty flat for both men and women. It's enormously upward sloping now. That is, this other supply response is there. So I, I would emphasize the labor market. I think the labor market is the place where the action is. I think it's the place where I think we have the most policy challenges. I would say when it comes to capital versus labor, I say the policy challenges are avoiding doing things that are silly. I think, the, uh, I think for capital versus labor, the one thing we could do would be to cut off what would be the natural supply responses that would help workers. Now, let me be clear. It may be that the supply response further exacerbates income shares, but the supply response will help workers. And that's the big difference between the two. That's why you don't want to just focus on shares. You want to focus on, on, on prices. But you would agree that there is a difference the way labor markets have evolved, even in terms of the price inequality, say, between Germany and, say, the U.S. And I guess the question Supply is... Supply stories are different, too. I mean, you right. don't want to just focus on demand. Again, you know, that, that's the point, is supply and demand matter in these markets. And supply matters a lot. You look at the U.S., it's pretty... Pretty, pretty clear. I did a comparison years ago comparing Canada and the U.S. Supply differences made a big difference between what was going on in Canada and the U.S. right across the border. So I, I think supply is an important part of the story. And limitations on supply are important not just because they, they affect that person, but they affect the overall marketplace. That's what makes them even more important. Right. Okay. Thomas. Yeah. No, you know, I think it's... It, I, I agree with a lot of what you said. I, I think I, I just let me stress that it's really important to go beyond the U.S. I mean, the U.S. is a fascinating country, of course, but you know, it's a, <laughs> the rest of the world is important also. And, and so, <laughs> you know, everything you said about the race between education and technology, the lack of supply of skills uh, in the U.S. Uh, uh, explaining inequality, I think is perfectly. Right, but what's interesting is that different countries have done differently. So you don't have, so you know, you don't have the same rise in inequality uh, in in uh, Europe, in particular in Northern Europe. You don't have uh, the same uh, rise in inequalities than in the U.S. And I think a big part of the explanation is exactly what you just stressed, which is insufficient supply uh, of skills uh, in the U.S. In particular, among the bottom groups of the population. But then the question becomes, you know, why is it that the U.S. Uh, society as a whole, and and in particular the most, uh, you know. Uh, the wealthiest part of the U.S. society, you know, don't want to pay for the, the education of the bottom groups and don't want this kind of, uh, of uh, you know, more inclusive educational systems that we see in other societies. And, and it's a big, you know, I think it's a big question. You know, some people looking at this from Europe, you know, have the feeling that, you know, maybe uh, and you have such a large uh, country, you know, the f and, and very diverse, you know, the, so the feeling of solidarity is more difficult. And some people, you know, conclude looking at that from Europe that they should, you know, go back to a sort of small nation states and not go for more European integration, which, you know, I feel I feel very concerned with because I believe very much in political integration. But it's true that, you know, there's this lack of response to inequality in the U.S. is something that is uh, is very striking. Another explanation which people give is, of course, the, the fact that 
high inequality feeds into uh, very uh, uh, unequal access to political influence, to political voice, uh, to the financing of political life, uh, and, you know, especially when you are in a legal system where you have almost no limitation on uh, how much uh, private money uh, can buy into politics. So in any case, you know, the, I, I agree with everything you said about race between education and technology, but this raises broader question as to why some countries you know, do not respond uh, in terms of increasing the supply of skills for, for, uh, uh, for you know, in a more inclusive manner for broader group uh, uh, in, the, in the population. Steve? So let, let me make some uh, somewhat uh, disparate comments. The measurement one is problematic for the approach I discussed because it, the, uh, the literature on what I'm calling psychological economics and the literature on sociological economics, they, they're still very much in their infancies. And so I'd be very hard pressed to, uh, except for people on the stage, uh, quote any papers where I think that there's, where the evidence I would say is definitive. There just are deep identification problems, for example, in disentangling the role of self-selection versus the effect of a residential neighborhood versus, uh, as nerdy as it may sound, aggregated heterogeneity. Is it a good teacher that explains a classroom doing well, or is it that the kids are interacting in a particular way? That said, I, I believe essentially everything I said feeds into, into Kevin's arguments in the following sense, which is the issue is the skills that people bring to the labor force, broadly defined, and really what I was talking about were the mechanisms that are determining those skill levels. And so in my judgment, the fact that 65%, uh, uh, that about a third of, of African American uh, adolescents fail to complete high school, that's the explanation. Once you know that fact, you have something that's first order in terms of understanding why that uh, particular community is doing poorly. And so I really, uh, to the extent I, want to, I would quantify anything, I'm just gonna uh, uh, be parasitic on, on what Kevin said. The second set of comments I wanted to make had to do with the heterogeneity of, uh, of experiences across countries. And, and Thomas, I think, you know, very correctly argues that there's a large range of, of, of institutional differences and political responses that condition whatever the roles are of technology and uh, the, the, I'll say, the, the socioeconomic mechanisms that we have discussed. That said, I am personally somewhat less persuaded that the issue is that there's an instability in the U.S. Uh, system that, that economic inequality feeds into political inequality, feeds into economic I don't want to exaggerate, but uh, the re reason I think that, that that's only a piece of the explanation is that it underestimates a word that economists are very uncomfortable with, which is ideology. In other words, Americans think differently about what the obligations are of a government. And it's not, it's not just a matter of solidarity, it's a matter of the objectives that they believe a society ought to fulfill. So David Potter, the uh, historian, once said that the key distinction between Americans and the rest of the world is the rest of the world believes in leveling down, we believe in leveling up. And so my argument would be that if you're looking at something such as redistributive taxes, the answer to the question why they're lower here is really the same answer to the question, why was there never a socialist party here? And many other, you know, sort of chestnut problems in, uh, in, in history. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now this is a, a good, good opening shot. Uh, but l let, me, let, let me follow up though with this, if I could. I don't want to stifle discussion, and I certainly want to keep the flow going. But uh, it's, I it's a lot more. Well, there's a couple other things. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I want to pick up, because I, I, I want to become Steve for a second, because, <laughs> I mean, he, Steve talked about skills. It was about human capital skills bought to the wor workplace. And I think what he really meant to say, because this is his way of thinking, skills brought to life. Yeah. That it really, and, and it's really important to remember that, that this is not just about what you can do in the market. It's about crime, it's about addiction, it's about, it's about substance abuse, it's about many, many things, how your family relationships, it's, it's, it, it's so much broader than just earnings. So, and, and, but again, it's all, I, in my mind, centered around human capital, which is such a central part of doing all that. Uh, I, I just don't see how, how that would not be the case. Um, in terms of why countries are different, I mean, again, you don't want to get fall into this game of thinking this is inevitable that we were going to fall short. Now, but there is a part that I do want to emphasize, which is the idea that we had a lot of poorly educated people and people who were disenfranchised from getting human capital is not new. That's been around forever. 
it just didn't matter as much when there were a lot of things for people without human capital to do. And the march of technology has meant more and more over time. There's not that much for you to do if you don't have much human capital. And so I would say probably old problems within a country and old differences across countries can lead to different growth rates because they're diff they differ in importance as the world changes. So you don't need a change in one country relative to a change in the other to generate a divergence. It's really that they had already differences that were then brought out by what developed. Tomorrow, you wanted that? Yeah, no, so regarding uh, US attitudes toward inequality, I, let, let me follow up on what you said. You know, I think it's, um, you know, this idea, you know, every country, you know, likes to portray itself as being, you know, more uh, meritocratic, more prone to equal opportunity. And, and you know, Just that's fine. I didn't know. say the U.S. was that way. I said Americans think of themselves yeah. that way. Yeah, oh, exactly. <laughs> no, I think every country, you know, I think in every country, people think themselves of that way. You know, there's nothing unique uh, about, about the U.S. You know, I can tell you in my country also, people feel unique. You know, everywhere people feel unique. You know, I'm sure in, Ch <laughs> in China, I'm sure they do as well. You know, so the question is, is it true? You know, what do we know about whether the US is about leveling up versus other countries leveling down. Well, as you said, you know, in terms of mobility, the measures of mobility that we have is that there is actually less mobility than uh, in the northern European countries you described. And so maybe at some point in history, you know, in the 19th century, there was more mobility, at least in white uh, America. Um, uh, but, uh, but certainly today, that doesn't seem to be, to be the case anymore. Now, regarding U.S. attitudes toward progressive taxation. You know, I think it's important to remember that progressive taxation was invented in America, yeah. certainly not in Europe. And that, you know, that's very important to have in mind. Otherwise, we are missing a very important part of the story, which is that attitudes toward inequality change over time. You know, they are not given forever. You know, and they can change again, and they will change again. So, you know, there's a very interesting speech which I advise everybody to read, which is a speech given by Irving Fisher when he was a president of the American Economic Association. And in 1919, he gave this speech. Um, uh, so, as you know, Irving Fisher was not particularly left-wing, uh, but he came to the American Economic Association and he said, well, you know, my fellow American economists, the big problem with the US economy today is inequality. You know, inequality is getting enormous. We have uh, the top 2% of the distribution uh, owns 50% of the wealth. We are going in the direction of Europe, where the top 1% owns 50% of the wealth. So this was in 1919. And indeed, inequality was a lot higher in Europe at the time in terms of concentration of wealth. And Irving Fisher was very concerned with this. So what are we going to do? So of course, we are not going to have a Bolshevik revolution. We are not going to have. But so he sought hard, and he came with a solution, which was we, have, we need very progressive taxation of income and inherited wealth. And his proposal was simple, was, OK, at the first generation, we are going to tax one third of inheritance, second generation, two thirds, third generation, three thirds. You know, this is almost what happened, in the sense that the top inheritance tax rate were set at 70, 80 percent during the interwar in the US. They've been there at this level until the 70s. There is no example of a country in Europe you know, certainly not France, certainly not Germany, not Scandinavia that has gone so far in terms of tax progressivity as the US between 1920 and 1980. So not, not during a few years, during many, many decades. And apparently this did not destroy American capitalism. You know, if, if anything, the productivity growth rate, which must reflect, you know, innovation and, and uh, other, uh, uh, you know, uh, behavior uh, which are conducive to, to productivity growth, you know, the productivity growth rate were higher at that time, you know, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, that they have been in the recent decade. So I think it's time you know, to look at this evidence again. You know, I think the, the, uh, this attitude towards inequality, you know, the idea that, by definition, some countries don't want this and some other countries want that, well, history tells us a different, you know, different picture, gives us a different picture. Okay, I, I think that that's oversimplifying the American historical experience. I'm not trying to reify some permanent difference in ideologies the source of the movement to progressive taxation was derivative not from the fact of inequality, it was from the mechanism of generating it. Mm -hmm. And so I think that in the Ameri the way to make a politically successful argument for pro-egalitarian policies has to focus on reasons that are conducive to what I'm calling the ideology of the United oh, States, yeah. which has some differences from other countries. Then it's no deeper than that. And so if you talk about the progressive taxation, that had to do with monopolies, rent-seeking, and the like. It mm -hmm. was not the very fact of inequality. And 
by analogy, attitudes towards Bill Gates' fortune are quite different from John D. Rockefeller's. Well, I, uh, certainly Bill Gates' attitude is uh, different, but you know, it's... Uh, now the American public <laughs> look, is different. But, I mean, well, okay. you know, th this views... Uh, look, this is where, you know, of course ideology matters and there's an independent evolution of ideology from the evolution of money. But I think money also has an impact on ideology because, you know, the production of ideas, the production of views, the political influence, you know, the, I'm, I'm, you know I'm not saying everything is explained by this, but I, I, I don't think you will... Uh, deny that you know this must have some impact, and you know I, that I, the, I, I, there I, is I, some I, feedback yeah. from no, inequality I, to I, the political, uh, uh, you know, the financing of political campaigns, which yeah. also feeds back on these views, which do not just come in a vacuum. And you know, <laughs> I, I really want to come back to something though, that's been talked about here because this is always it seems to me it's confusion because you know the idea that more meritocracy means more mobility. I just don't see how you get from here to there. In a world in which there really are real advantages of coming from a better community, come, coming from a family that has more human capital, and all those things, having a bigger meritocracy where there was greater rewards to, in, to working hard, investing, whatever the heck you want to call it, those differences and opportunities may be exacerbated in that world relative to the world where they squish the differences between how well you do based on your outcome. Because the people have greater incentive to take advantages of the advantages that they have. So the idea that we can measure meritocracy by somehow linking it to say, well, more meritocracy means more mobility, I think it's just not correct. Just talking about most reasonable theories of investment, that's not going to give it to you. What it can do is exacerbate the underlying inequalities that exist. Because when you, when, if, there, if you make the rewards to taking advantage of your advantages greater, they're going to manifest themselves more in end outcomes. And so I, I just don't get this link between mobility and meritocracy. It just as an economist, I, I don't see where you so, get it. So you think it's OK if there's very little mobility? No, I'm not saying it. I'm not, this is not a normative judgment. I'm saying you can't say, well, if I had a meritocracy where everybody got paid what they produced and just you know, how good you were is all that mattered that world could have much less mobility because the children of the parents who could give those kids the advantages because they lived in the better neighborhood, because they themselves were more educated, would be able to do those things. Those are real advantages. It's not the idea that my advantage, and this is why I would think, Steve, you'd be all over this, because it's not just my genes that I'm born with are my inherent endowment. So the view that there should be lots of mobility if it's a meritocracy is, well, the genes are pretty random. And therefore, the kid who's born in a lousy place, if there really is a meritocracy in terms of rewards, should get just as much as the smart kid born somewhere else. But in a world in which real environment matters, parents matter, neighborhoods matter, schools matter, that ain't going to happen. Well, I, I completely well, agree. Let me, to let, me, me the issue let, let me come back to this quantitative uh, issue that I raised. And by the way, uh, 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 we have people going around. I think we're almost near, if we want to, uh, collecting questions, a few questions I mean, from the audience. But let me come back to this. So historically, I mean, I would just interrupt in the discussion a little bit. There have been periods when there's been discrimination. When we think about you know, meritocracy really did provide opportunity for people who didn't get opportunity to go to school or do things and Absolutely. so forth. So I think the question is kind of quantitatively, or just now we think about society, not just US, but around the world. Just what is the relative importance of some of these factors that we've talked about? And therefore, what should be the kind of policies? So if it really is a system where people are being heavily discriminated against, and literally very smart, able people just can't go to school because they're born of a certain race or a certain ethnicity, then I think we would argue, right, that you know, a meritocracy would probably move towards more, more mobility, right, in that setting. But in the, in the current setting... Meritocracy and an opportunity. An opportunity, that's what I'm talking about. But that's another dimension here, which we really haven't been talking. I think it's implicit in what Steve was talking about. Wow. And I would try to argue not just, uh, not just in terms of the labor market returns, but just the opportunity to participate in the labor market. And I, I'm just asking whether or not anybody here maybe anybody here, would have, uh, would have uh, good quantitative estimates of just what's important and then what public policy should be. That's what I want to bring you all to. Because you recognize, as I understand it, most of you would agree there are certain forces that are common across countries, right? There is, I think, skill bias technical change. How countries respond to it, 
how system supply of you know labor changes that changes uh, th that is different but there are some common forces but i guess that's the question are there common forces are there social laws that are common across all the globe or can we really talk about something that's more individual and idiosyncratic and secondly then what should be the policy response if there are common forces i think most people are heading in that direction what should be you know in light of your opinion about where the really important aspects of inequality are found, whether it's a mobility, uh, opportunity, uh, and, and exposed wages after the market has settled its, uh, its, its outcomes. Uh, what, what should the appropriate policies be? What, what's indicated? I would be very curious about that. Come on, you want? Well, yeah, you know, regarding the, the policy response, I think it's, uh, it's clearly a combination of, uh, of education, labor market institution, progressive taxation. For education, you know, I think we have to get into the admission process uh, to high school, to university, you know, the idea that we can just let, uh, uh, you know, everybody do what they want and without any possibility to study what's really going on in the admission process and that we will get to more equal opportunities just by uh, without uh, uh, having this more transparent. Uh, I think this is not going to work. So I think we, you know, I, I, this is something universities are resisting a lot. Uh, but, uh, I, I, you know, I think if we want to, to better understand what's going on, we cannot just, uh, uh, you know, wait. Uh, and and we, we, we need to, and in different countries, you know, there are attempts to go to more transparent admission system uh, and more transparent uh, 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 positive uh, discrimination uh, system to, to allow uh, children from bottom income backgrounds to increase their probability to access a number of, of schools. Uh, if you don't have, if you cannot access the data on how uh, the schools select their students and what uh, parental wealth uh, role is playing, what parental income role is playing, you know, it's very difficult to make uh, any progress. The other policy uh, issue I wanted to mention, uh, Kevin mentioned the issue of, of uh, uh, you know, possible increased importance of uh, physical capital, non-human capital uh, in the future and, and saying, well, basically we should just wait for the supply of physical capital to make this beneficial to everybody. And, you know, I certainly agree that, uh, you know, waiting can be a good solution and that the supply of capital can, can uh, uh, solve the problem. But, you know, I would prefer to have a plan B, you know, in case uh, this doesn't work. And uh, so I think, you know, to me, what's important is to have, again, uh, the possibility to adapt the tax system, both the tax rate for progressive uh, taxation of income and also for progressive taxation of property uh, and wealth to adapt the tax rate to whatever we see. And if we see that the problem uh, is solved by itself, you know, because the uh, supply and demand of capital is making, in the end, all groups benefit from this uh, new uh, uh, robots or whatever technology which are replacing uh, uh, labor, if we don't need to correct the trends, then you know, I will be very happy. But you know, the problem is that if we don't have more transparency about how the different income groups and wealth groups uh, uh, are doing, then it's very difficult to adapt the policy system. So Bob Schiller made the proposal uh, late last year or earlier this year to say, OK, we should index uh, income tax progressivity to whatever happened to, the, to, the, to income inequality and how fast the different percentiles are growing. And I think for, for uh, the ownership of, uh, of physical uh, capital and wealth, you, know, you, you, you can make a, a similar case, which is that you, know, you want to be able to adjust the tax system. Otherwise, you know, it's a bit magical. You, know, you just expect that we should wait and that everybody, uh, that natural forces uh, of supply and demand are going to solve the problem and that the distribution will be under control in the long run. Well, you know, look, maybe this will happen, maybe not. So in the meantime, we need to be able collectively to, to adapt the policy. <laughs> I, I, I never meant to say that the natural forces are going to solve all your problems. I mean, if, if you had a growth in capital, it would not necessarily solve the problem for the least skilled relative to the most skilled. It would exacerbate that problem, if anything. You have to have the human capital response in order to help that low skilled group, because they're not going to be helped by the growth in capital. There, that's going to further benefit the high-skilled group. And I think if there's a worry that we're running into a situation where there's a fixed factor other than, say, labor as a whole that's going to gain the benefits of improved technology, it's skilled labor. I think that's the group that, in the long run, could, could avoid this. And 
I, I think we need to we need to think hard about about again. That's why we have to focus on on physical capital. Now, in terms of the idea that I'm going to index the tax structure to the changes in prices, I mean, I've always thought about it as one of the worst ideas I've ever heard. I mean, <laughs> it's like assuring that there's not going to be a supply response. It's like if the price of oil goes up, we'll just tax it so much that suppliers get the same return they used to. Well, if there was a shortage of oil, and then you say, oh, man, I haven't solved the shortage of oil. Price of oil going up. Wow, raise the price, raise the tax even more. You're just going to feed into the problem. I mean, I just I never understood that proposal. It, if you really well, made. No, but here, you just need to redistribute the oil. You know, that's simple in your example. So no, this because is you never property. get the supply. Yes. You right. may be able to get the money. Now, this gets right. my other point. But this is, I think, absolutely critical. We, if, if, you, if you're worried about inequality, you don't want to get to a world where we're taxing one group who's producing and giving money to the, another group who's not. That would be like, a, that's the worst world. That's the most unequal world I could possibly think of. I mean, I am now either in this group over here or I'm in that group over there who like, you know, and you think that's going to solve the other social issues we've got, the other things that Steve talked about? Heck no. We have to find a way to keep the broad segment of the population engaged, engaged in the economy, engaged in the activities of society. And that's the notion of inequality. That's why we have to go beyond income. Just giving people income, I don't think is going to be the answer. We want them to get income by including them in the economy. So that's, that's where I think we need to go. Well, we'll get back to this question of incentives, but go ahead, Steve. I, I think one of the uh, background issues is that there's a lot of, frankly, unuseful terms, meritocracy, I, and even inequality. In other words, that I, I think the forward way to think about where political philosophy is even is we care about people having opportunities to flourish, and that that definition of flourishing is quite broad. And that to try to reduce it down to an intergenerational correlation coefficient, a Gini coefficient, all that really is missing the point that it's about individuals having trajectories. So with that as the background, my view immediately on policy is to think about, uh, what's that term, Lars? Robustness. In other words, we have many different policies we can think about uh, as ways to promote this vague notion I've referred to as flourishing, which includes both the creation of opportunities and letting people make mistakes. You know, quality of opportunity is actually a little too puritanical for my taste. People screw up. Teenagers get pregnant. They get in jail, et cetera, and, even the, and th those have to be accounted for as well. But the serious point is that if we think about human capital policies, I think one of the important advantages is that there's a certain robustness to them. It's fine to say, well, maybe we will uh, create disincentives for capital or something, or maybe not. That's the whole point of thinking about robust mechanisms that can facilitate these, these broader notions of flourishing outcomes, but recognize the level of ignorance we have in terms of the design of policies to promote research and development or to possibly inhibit that. So I, I think that that's all that has to be on the table in terms of talking about policies. To recognize the extent of ignorance, but not treat that as, as, as nihilism and saying there's nothing to say afterwards, but to then ask the question, given what we know, what would appear to be robust ways to proceed? Yeah, how would you answer your own question there, your own, your own notion? So how would you proceed specifically in saying, OK, given that you don't really know fully, but what, what looks like a good policy proposal in light of all of the discussion and all of these issues about equality of opportunity, to get access to the larger society, and then income and equality in adulthood. How, what, what, what's indicated? I, that's what I'd like each yeah, of you to suggest. Listen, and should I, there be anything indicated? I, Kevin, do you want to say, well, yeah, I, eventually I mean, let it rip, and, I, I, uh, <laughs> and eventually like it'll come back? Already, right? I mean, <laughs> I guess what I would say is, one thing that strikes me is, is when, when the returns to going to higher education went up in the early 80s, the number of people going on to school went up real quickly. That went up right away. And, it, and, and But the, the, the sad part was a lot of people weren't very successful at, at, at getting their way through school. And to me, that signaled that a lot of people weren't well, well, well prepared, the, the, the preparation. And this gets back to the point of getting the kids early and getting them prepared early, because right. it's very hard to catch up once you're behind. Right. Um, now, the sad part is that's a long-term process. That is, it's going to take, if we could snap our fingers today and fix the educational system for every kid coming in at age four or five into the US, I mean, that doesn't even start impacting the labor market for the next 
for another 15 years. They don't become half the labor market for another 35 years. I still think that's what we got to do because I think, like Steve said, that is our most robust policy is to get those people. And, and helping them will help the other people, the people that we can't help who, and the people who are already out down the pipeline. I still, so I think focusing on the young, but also focus, if you give them better opportunities, many of them will take advantage of it. People are not all perfect. They don't all look out for their own interest, but enough of them do that I think if you give them more opportunity, you know, you go to pe poor people in this neighborhood, you go poor people every place I know of, most of them want to do better. And but a lot of them behind the eight ball because of where they grow up and the situation they find themselves in. So I, I think education reform and doing things to improve competition in the education marketplace is really important. Uh, so let me ask, let me, let me follow up on that. So I just, and Toma, you, you've been a little silent on the, 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 the distinction that Steve raised early in the debate or the discussion, and that was to, uh, to, to talking, you're talking about the university admission and so forth. And if I take the thrust of what's being said by the others here, that maybe that's a little too late. And so the question then becomes, when we think about education policy more broadly, what would be an appropriate education policy and how it broadly defined? So we're giving opportunity. So for example, in France, for example, there's a very large population that, at least here across the Atlantic, we see, we hear about, for example, the, the French population that's of Arabic origin seems to be somewhat excluded from the society from its larger. So the question is, how would you produce that kind of integration where there's more opportunity for somebody born of Islamic uh, uh, origins uh, from North Africa, say? Right. So no, I, I agree that you know, university admission in some cases is too late. So we need, together with uh, you know, more transparency about university admission, uh, we, do, we need to invest more at a much, much earlier age. And, and so I, I think you know, if we take not only France, but you know, Europe in general, you know, I would say that the uh, inequality in funding for the primary education system or even you know, pre-primary education system and, and junior uh, high school education system is less inegalitarian than in the US. So it, 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 you know, it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of inequality. It's certainly not perfect. But by and large, the supply of skills uh, has been in recent decades uh, you know, a bit more inclusive Okay. Uh, than in this country. And I think, and this is perfectly consistent with what the two of you have said. This is one of the big explanations for why uh, rising inequality in the US uh, uh, has been stronger than in those other countries. So I, I fully agree with the fact that you know, university is uh, very important, but that's not enough. You yeah. want to act uh, uh, much, uh, much earlier. That's, that's clear. Now, I, I want to emphasize again that you know, the historical evidence we have from uh, uh, European countries, but also from the own history of the US, is that uh, broad-based investment in education and progressive taxation you know, are not substitutes. These are complementary policies. They can come together, they can work together, and they can deliver uh, sustainable growth with productivity growth rates, which are much higher than what we've seen in the US in recent decades. So you know, the view that you know, we need to keep uh, this level of uh, inequality in order to keep incentives and, and productivity growth just doesn't square with the fact, which is that the productivity growth performance uh, of the US economy in, in the past uh, uh, 20, 30 years you know, has not been terribly good by historical uh, standards, uh, in particular as compared to the earlier decades uh, in, in this country. So, so, uh, you know, all these policies, you know, instead of, uh, you know, just saying that's only human capital, that's only progress, you know, I think we need to conduct all of them uh, together. I see no, no reason uh, to oppose them as, as uh, uh, I thought, you know, Kevin was doing. So and I can't, I can't Kevin, pin anybody down to come yeah. up with a quantitative estimate, so I guess <laughs> well, I'll, 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 I'll just get <laughs> abdicate. What well, units let me, do you let me want ask, it in, oh, <laughs> What that? units? What units do you want it in? Well, <laughs> but across the different dimensions we've talked about, social mobility, for example, uh, you know, you were suggesting maybe social mobility is greater in France or maybe some countries. Mm, that's, I mean, yes, that's, that's not true. the image that we have here, but, you know, we're oh, not there. This so. is the data. But yeah. I thought the, the graph to describe uh, on mobility inequality, I think all, uh, all European countries uh, have more mobility than the, the West. The, in I the mean, graph you described. But, I mean, well, but how much of the mobility is the mobility of skill and how much of it is kind of mobility that comes after tax income? 
I mean, no, there's no, a real no. question about no, exactly how much. I, I think these aggregated statements are often misleading. Do we really well, want many to... of the comments from the audience are saying exactly that. They want I mean, you do all we, disaggregate. Do we, do we want to say the United States is a particularly unfriendly place for immigrants? I would. I, mean, I, yeah, I can give you an ex a dimension where the United States is spectacularly uh, mobile. And, uh, and I, I can't say anything negative about France. It's just I, I think that, <laughs> that oh, there, but, there's, there's a reification <laughs> of, of inequality mobility into these categories when, in fact, you, the, the mechanisms are so different across groups that it, it's misleading. Mm. I agree. I mean, it gets back to kind of the point I was trying to make before. I mean, inequality, I mean mobility is, is, is an outcome. It's not a measure, it's not a measure of opportunity. It's, it's, no, it's, a, it's an outcome, but it's an interesting outcome. So, you know, the kind of... Absolutely. The, the kind, so are, so I'm the, not saying it's not. I'm so, just saying you, you know, I'm just use... telling you the kind of comparison, since you raised it, you know, on, on, uh, uh, you know elite institutions, educational institutions in the U.S. versus France. You know, I, in my book, I compare, you know, if you take the average income of parents of schools like Harvard, or, you know, I guess, I don't know how different it will be in Chicago or Stanford. So for Harvard, you, 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 the average income of parents corresponds to the top 2% of the distribution on average. I did the same exercise. I reported in my book for uh, Sciences Po, which will be one of the most elitist institutions in Paris. What you get is the top 10 percent, which is, uh, you know, a bigger uh, basin of recruitment, if you want. But this is still, of course, very elitist because this means that you know it's as if all students had been picked at random in the top 10 rather than the entire population. So you know, I think no country is in a position to give lessons on uh, you know this is the best model, this is the perfect model. You know, I'm, I'm just saying that the. Uh, inequality in access to higher education in this particular country has reached levels which, uh, you know, you can choose to ignore it and say, well, you know, the less mobility, the better, because it means that the very talented get rewarded, etc. But, you know, at some point, uh, you know, I think the numbers are, are striking. But it seems to me that this actually is another dimension of policy that hasn't been discussed, and that is that incomes being reified is the only thing to change. Just to give two examples. One, I think the differences between the United States and, and France in terms of these elite fractions, I don't think it has anything to do with the income distribution directly, that is in affordability. It has to do with something else, which is what's happening for, uh, to kids during life course Absolutely. development. More generally, many of the issues that are on the table may not, the remedy may not be progressive taxes or some other uh, leveling policy per se, but palliating and reducing the consequences. So I fully agree that there's serious problems with the role of money in politics in the United States. But that, to me, does not constitute an argument for more progressive taxes. It, it actually is an argument for something called progressivism. In other words, political reforms that try to address that. And I think I could plausibly argue that if money's as corrupting as you've argued, there's no possibility that you're going to get progressive taxes to self-correct. On the other hand, we have ample American history on times when political reform itself uh, was able to succeed and attenuate the, uh, the influence of finances. And so, again, I, I certainly am not, uh, you know, turning a blind eye to the role of money in politics, but I, I, and I meant that as an example of the more general thing, that many of the harms that are being discussed for inequality, it strikes me, can be directly addressed. And that's the whole, and a whole other area of policy that probably should be on the table. So let me, let me ask, let me bring the audience in, if only for the last few minutes. We only have five minutes left on the scheduled time. Uh, and there are a few questions that, are, that are, I think are, are of interest. Uh, and that is, uh, and several have, have raised this question, and it goes back to one of uh, the, the statements that Thomas mentioned, but uh, also has been mentioned by others. That's the role of firms and the role of kind of uh, price setting, very conspicuous in the public debate of this so-called 1%, the, the, the sort of top end. People looked at CEO earnings. They've looked, for example, at very sharp discrepancies. This is not at the bottom. We've, it actually is interesting. You started off, uh, people started off talking, saying we shouldn't only focus at the top, and we've spent most of the time at the bottom. <laughs> now I'm going to come back to the top in some sense, and that is what's the role of firms? You've talked about skill bias, technical change, but firms, wage setting policy, and some of the issues that arise in corporate finance. So there seem to be very sharp differences. Tomo, you've documented that mm. in your work with Saez, showing very sharp differences, say, between the English-speaking countries, generally speaking, and mm. some of the other your, your advanced countries uh, in terms of the uh, compensation and how concentrated income is. And you've linked that partly to CEO compensation and to the por performance more generally of the uh, labor market, uh, or the market, I should mm. say, or the, or the or the, maybe the manipulated market. So I'm, I'm curious what, so several uh, people from the floor have asked about that, and I would ask uh, Thomas to start initially, and then 
talk about this general question. That's a different aspect of inequality we haven't really talked about, sort of high income uh, right. in the, in earnings. Okay. So, you know, I, I, I think, you know, education is very important in general to explain human capital, to explain inequality in earnings. But at the very top, you know, it's, I think it's difficult to explain everything we see just with, uh, with uh, earnings and, and skill bias, technical change and, and uh, education and skill premium. Uh, at, at the very top, you know, within the top 1% of labor compensation, you know, it's not that the top 0.1 is, uh, has a lot more uh, skills than the next 0.1, at least in the, in the, when you make comparison between countries, again, you see huge differences in how uh, uh, very top managerial compensation has changed relative to the managerial compensation just below to the one percent or the few percent just below, and it's hard to imagine that it's because uh, in the U.S. you know the average skill of the top 0.1 percent is a lot higher than in all other countries relative to the next one percent. You know, that's, and so when you try to explain the level of top managerial compensation, you put a firm size. You put uh, finance versus non-finance. You put every explanatory factor you want. You don't. You really don't explain much in terms of these very big cross-country uh, differences in the rise of top major compensation. So, in my view, you need to uh, uh, you need to bring other factors, other institutional factors, change in corporate governance, uh, change in the tax system. You know, I think uh, uh, in the US, a huge decline in tax progressivity between the 70s and the 80s, 90s has increased enormously the incentives for top managers to bargain very aggressively and, and do whatever they can to get to get a pay uh, uh, increase. Uh, uh, other factors also matter. You know, if you want to explain differences between European countries, which are also very important, between Britain, Sweden, uh, Germany, uh, you know, I think corporate governance, the, the, the uh, implication of workers' representative and unions in pay setting. You know, in, in my country, for a long time, uh, the employers and, and shareholders, you know, they didn't want any worker representative uh, on board. You know, they said, you know, workers are going to take, uh, you know, crazy decisions. Uh, we don't want them on board, uh, at least not with voting right. And then at some point, you know, people told them, well, but look, in Sweden, you have one third of a board which are made of worker representative. In Germany, you have half of the board which are made of worker representative. And apparently, you know, Swedish firms, German firms are actually do doing better than what you're doing in France. So are you sure that this is a, this would be a catastrophe, you know, to try to involve them rather than just being in a conflict with, uh, with labor? Uh, and in the end, you know, last year, there was actually a law putting one seat uh, out of 12, uh, you know, board members for uh, for workers, you know, so it is not one third like in Sweden or one half like in Germany. But you know, I, I think it's important. This this kind of institutional uh, features has, I think, strong impact on wage formation. In particular, uh, there's a lot of evidence that it has impact on the level of top managerial compensation. And in the end, in terms of efficiency. And productivity, you know, I think uh, Swedish firms and German firms are doing uh, just fine. Okay, we actually have run out of time. Uh, I think people will stay around, but I, I would I would thank every participant in this discussion. Apologies to the audience for not getting all their questions in, but I think we've had a very good discussion. And I think I don't know if you're willing to stick around for a bit. We could have a we could have a follow up seminar, but I think we should let people escape. Okay.